Welcome to the Babylonian Podcast. I'm Michael Light, and I'm a Second Temple Jewish literature junkie and a big time Bible nerd. And on this podcast, I provide the perspective of Jews that lived just before Jesus from texts that we have like the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls, Philo, and more. With scholars, sages, and scriptures, let's Bible on. In this episode of The Babylonian, we are going to be looking at the book of two Maccabees, often called Second Maccabees. Uh, it is done so wrongly because Second Maccabees, quote unquote, is not the second of anything. Uh, well, it is a second account of the same story of uh, the Maccabean revolt that is also told in one Maccabees. Uh, and uh, part of which uh, is re- retold in 4th Maccabees, and which has an allegorical um, version in 3 Maccabees and in Judith. Uh, however, uh, because it is uh, simply one of many different types of Maccabees, a more precise and helpful word is, uh, or name is the name 2 Maccabees. Um, So, because of that, you don't have to listen to the most previous podcast episode. However, I would highly encourage uh, that you do, because one and two Maccabees uh, have a, uh, they have a lot in common. Uh, One Maccabees is uh, significantly more focused on uh, being more accurate to history. However, it's not necessarily uh, totally uh, unbiased, there's no sources, but, um, and, and you can even see this in how it portrays, for example, uh, Jonathan, uh, the brother of Judah Maccabee, um, and how it portrays Simon and Judah Maccabee as much greater, more important brothers, and Jonathan just is a Maccabee, but n- not as important nonetheless. It also shows how uh, whenever uh, other Jews try to lead wars against the oppressive Gentiles, they fail because they are not Maccabees. The purpose of them telling that story is to show that you will fail um, if you're not, like, like, the Maccabees are the ones that are uh, leading uh, Judea in its independence, and uh, it is sort of verifying the Hasmonean dynasty. That is the dynasty uh, that follows uh, jo- uh, Judah Maccabee. Um, and so there's a lot more to 1 Maccabees, and in fact, 1 Maccabees is the most important apocryphon. That's not a debate. Uh, so if you haven't listened to that podcast episode already, I would highly recommend it. 1 Maccabees is also just a really, really interesting and awesome Uh, apocryphon. So if you haven't listened to that episode, I would highly suggest it. However, you don't need to listen to it to listen to this podcast episode because it's two Maccabees, not second. Uh, With all that said, uh, let's dive into two Maccabees. Uh, Now, the book two Maccabees is 15 chapters long. Uh, And if I remember correctly, one Maccabees uh, yeah, one Maccabees is 16 chapters long, just one chapter longer. Um, and again, these chapters, uh, quite a few of these chapters are pretty long. Uh, we're talking about 40 verses. Um, you know, some of them are about 30, about 30 or, or 45 verses. Um, and I'm just uh, trying to give you an idea of the size of what it might be like uh, to read to Maccabees if you're interested in this. And hopefully, uh, after listening to this podcast, you do take some interest in in reading uh, to Maccabees. So anyways, um, 
uh, one Maccabees is focused on the history and it's it's very much supportive of the whole Hasmonean dynasty that uh, Judah Maccabee uh, began the fight or, or really uh, Mattathias his father um, began this whole initiative of um, liberating uh, Judea and that was passed on to his son Judah Maccabee uh, his brother Eliezer died bef- was the first of the, the, the Hasmoneans to die. Hasmonean is the, is the name for the whole family. Anyways, Judah Maccabee is kind of the leader. Uh, then uh, when he dies, his brother Jonathan is the leader until he dies, in which case Simon uh, takes over. And, you know, this author is just uh, all out, outright supportive of the Maccabees. There's not really... A question about that they're about they're supportive of the entire dynasty um as them being uh hasmoneans and so it's not uh it's it's historically focused on the hasmonean dynasty uh, however two maccabees actually does not tell the story of it doesn't reference mattathias at all uh and in fact it ever so briefly mentions the fact that Judah Maccabee has brothers, but then does not give any role to them. Um, and in fact, it actually, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, gives one of them the wrong name. Like, the, the brothers um, of the Maccabees, of, of Judah Maccabee, are insignificant, in, according to the author of Two Maccabees. Uh, but what two Maccabees does want to do, uh, remember that one Maccabees, if you had listened to the last podcast, if not, um, again, it's an apocryphon, which means it's heavily inspired uh, by the ideas uh, found in Deuteronomy, especially. That is uh, the necessity for covenant faithfulness. When uh, the Jews, God's chosen people, are faithful to him and they follow all the uh, instructions in the Torah, then uh, God will respond by giving them prosperity um, and blessing them in the land and being with them and protecting them. It's because it's not because they were strong and powerful that God gave them land, but because they were small. But God fought for them and God gave them miraculous victories. However, if they disobey the Torah that God has given them, because God has chosen them to be a kingdom of priests, uh, when they fail to do that and they're disobedient to the Torah, they don't live by its rules, then they will experience uh, the results of covenant unfaithfulness. God has protected uh, all of Israel when they were faithful. So if they are unfaithful, then God is going to take a step back and let uh, the nations, the Gentiles, Uh, come and attack them and depress them and destroy them. Uh, Further, uh, when they are unfaithful, things fall into chaos. Everything falls into chaos, as we're going to see in the book of Two Maccabees. Now, Two Maccabees is also significantly more apocalyptic than One Maccabees. Oh, I... um. I forgot to mention one other thing for two Maccabees. Um, one Maccabees focuses on how Judea had been brought into Gentile, Gentile hands, how it was oppressed by them, especially because of these renegade Jews, these apostates uh, who were giving up the Torah, uh, being absolutely unfaithful to God, uh, doing what they wanted. People were... On a consistent, regular basis, there were multiple people attempting to buy out the high priesthood that had to be, you had to be given the high priesthood as a person. Uh, You had to be born, like, in a priestly family and made high priest. You could not buy it. But multiple Jews were paying the Gentiles to to get the high priesthood. Um, And Jews were even bringing... Uh, disaster upon themselves. The Jews who were apostatizing and giving over the Torah uh, were the ones who were actively being the officers that Antiochus had uh, appointed to have the other Jews destroyed. Now, those things aren't all necessarily mentioned in 2 Maccabees. It does talk about the unfaithful Jews. It doesn't have that same term renegades used throughout, Um, but 
it does talk about how the unfaithfulness of the Jews is bringing about uh, destruction and chaos in, in all of Israel. Um, but 2 Maccabees also has a really uh, distinct focus on the fact that at the same time, uh, Israel's sins, uh, when Israel sins and, and they're unfaithful, they will reap the consequences of that. But those that are faithful to the Torah, uh, not only does God let, let the people prosper, remember, even if there are people, uh, there are so many being faithful in Israel to the Torah, if there is a, a, a small group within that that's unfaithful, then all Israel suffers on that account. But in the same way, in two Maccabees, this isn't brought out in one Maccabees, uh, there's, as we're going to see in this story, there is a, a, a very big focus on uh, martyrdom and the fact that those who are faithful, when they are faithful to Yahweh and they follow him and they die for him and for following him and being obedient, God hears that. And on that account, God protects Israel again, uh, as if they were covenantly faithful. He he hears, uh, their he he hears them, their blood, uh, so as to say, to use biblical language, and he responds to that by liberating them. And that's exactly what we're going to see as kind of the cause effect into Maccabees. So, uh, without any further ado, uh, let's jump in to this. And before we do, I'm just going to again say you can find all these resources on my website that's in the show notes to this episode. So uh, michaeljlight.com or thebibelonian.com. If you scroll down to the bottom, you can hit Apocrypha. You can also see uh, works and writings at the top. Click that or from the drop down menu, click Apocrypha. You can see everything else, but you can see all my Apocrypha notes there. Uh, Introductions to all the Apocrypha up to to Maccabees at uh, the release of this podcast. Uh, all my podcasts are there, all my notes on biblical references and questions of, of importance. Uh, it's all there. So everything, that is the hub for the Apocrypha. Uh, I wanted to make you aware of that. Again, if you don't want to type that in, it's in the show notes. You can just reach it there. With that said, let's uh, jump into the actual text of 2 Maccabees. Let's see how all these things work out, and then I'll note other uh, extremely significant parts. Uh, so, uh, the book of 2 Maccabees actually begins with a letter. Um, so, the opening letter ranges from chapters uh, 1 through 2. And so, it begins, it says, uh, The Jews in Jerusalem and those in the land of Judea to their Jewish kindred in Egypt. So, it's Jews in Jerusalem writing to those in Egypt. Um, and it, it, it pretty much is an encouragement to them uh, to continue in being faithful to the Torah in following God and praying. Um, and it talks about how they're praying for them and uh, how they were had been faithful. And uh, that gives a brief summary of the, the kind of oppression that came upon them. And they encourage them to keep the festival of booths in the month of Chislev in the 188th year. Um, So, uh, anyways, what they're actually referring to here is they're referring to, as we're going to see, the festival of Hanukkah, or uh, the festival of the rededication of the temple, which is actually, uh, in the New Testament scriptures, it talks about that, uh, I believe it's... It's one chapter in John. I, I want to say John chapter 10, but it, um, I'm not entirely sure. But that's actually significant. Um, but we're going to see what what the that whole feast is about. But that is compared to the Feast of, uh, of Booths. And the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Sukkot, is all about uh, Israel re- remembering how they were in Egypt um, and how they were sojourners, uh, n- not, not in Egypt, sorry, in the wilderness in between their time in Egypt and in Canaan, and how they're supposed to build for themselves booths um, or, or tents or tabernacles out of uh, nature, natural things. Uh, and that's how they're to remember that. And the author of uh, 2 Maccabees is going to uh, show how there is a new, not a replacement of that feast, but a new type of feast that is very similar to that, that uh, they're going to encourage people to continue celebrating 
even though they are not going to claim any uh, biblical support for them. They don't see themselves as writing scripture. <coughs> uh, but anyways, so they continue to write on, and uh, they they mention how Antiochus, now uh, there are multiple Antiochus, even in this account of the Maccabees, and also in one Maccabees, but this is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes. Again, there are multiple Antiochus Epiphanes, which does not help. Uh, although there are less Antiochus Epiphanes than there are Antiochuses. And this Antiochus Epiphanes is Antiochus the Fourth Epip Epiphanes. Um, and so he talks about how this Antiochus Epiphanes had gone uh, to Persia so that he could uh, make a, a sort of um, marriage with this goddess Nenea. And anyways, uh, when he comes over to be with him, and by the way, the name Epiphanes means manifestation of God. So if that doesn't say anything else to the arrogance of Antiochus to call himself the manifestation of God and to go and try and marry a goddess, uh, there you have it right there. Anyways, this is actually really not that important. But anyways, he goes over to that temple, but uh, the priests had opened like a secret door in the ceiling, and then they just throw uh, stones on them, and they attack him, and so uh, he runs off. Um, and it just mentions that, and it just blesses God for that, and you'll be like, okay, that's kind of rude, but as you go on to read the, uh, the rest of the account, you'll see kind of why they uh, are happy about that, but as to the significance of that actual event, that's, you know, debatable. And uh, I did forget to mention, but the actual dating of this letter, uh, so either this letter, either this is all one work, two Maccabees for, from chapters 1 to 15, or this letter, chapters 1 through 2, was later added on to a text that was already one Maccabees, uh, two Maccabees. So in other words, uh, you could, starting in chapter 3, read uh, about... Uh, two Maccabees, or actually, uh, I think a, 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 a better place would be two Maccabees, chapter two, uh, verse nineteen, and it says the story of Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, and the purification of the great temple, and the dedication of the altar, and it goes on to describe that and continues on and tells the story, without ever. Well, um, actually, I believe there is uh, maybe one or two times where the author stops to state something. But uh, anyways, it's very possible that two Maccabees could be what's called a composite writing. In other words, uh, it's the, it is composed of two different works. The original, um, which would be two Maccabees chapter 2 verse 19 to the end, that was one work, that was one writing. And then later on, a, a fan of this work liked it. Um, they, they had a letter that they had written. And they kind of wanted to, that would be a, a pseudepigraphal letter. They're writing as if they're Jews in Jerusalem, as all of this was just recent. And then they kind of, they copy all of two Maccabees, but they copy their letter first, and then they copy two Maccabees. So I hope that all makes sense. That's about as basic of a, of a description as what I could give. Um, but this could be written anytime around like uh, the 150s to the, um, the 60s, I believe. Um, but... Uh, either way, uh, you know, it, it seems that that letter was probably added on later. So uh, that might also explain why it's uh, uh, significant that that story is actually a lot less significant. So anyways, uh, the story, he, he goes on and he says to uh, the since on the uh, 25th day of Chislev, we shall celebrate the purification of the temple, we thought it necessary to notify you. Now, remember, uh, it says on the 25th day to uh, celebrate the purification of the temple, which is going to go on to tell the story of how that actually happened, what happened there. Um, and uh, earlier, it said to uh, keep the festival of booths in the month of Chislev. Um, so, uh, it's pretty much... You can see by that later uh, verse in verse 18 that the earlier verse in, nine, in verse 9 where it says to keep the uh, festival of booths that it's actually, um, according to my understanding, it's actually telling them to keep the festival of the rededication of the temple. And 
they do in the text in the actual book itself compare the two feasts um but they continue on uh that to say that this festival they try to give it a grounds um in the scriptures uh actually in a sense and they're going to actually give uh the actual historical background later but in this uh most likely pseudepigraphal or forged letter they go on to say that uh that they should celebrate the purification of the temple uh and that they thought that they should let them know uh, that they should celebrate uh, the festival of booths and the festival of the fire uh, given when Nehemiah, who built the temple and the altar, offered sacrifices. So Nehemiah uh, was one of the three major people, uh, Ezra and Zerubbabel being the other uh, major Jews, who led the Jews out of exile in Persia to Israel, to uh, especially to restore the, the temple and uh, the walls. So he's actually talking about the, crea the building of the second temple, if you were confused there. Uh, but continuing on, uh, he says that when they were led out of Persia, uh, pious priests uh, took some of the fire of the altar and secretly hid it in the hollow of a dry cistern where they took such precautions that the place was unknown to anyone. That's in uh, 2 Maccabees 1.19. After many years had passed, when it pleased God, Nehemiah, uh, having been commissioned by the king of Persia, sent the descendants of the priests who had hidden the fire to get it. Anyways, uh, they go on, but they don't find the fire, but only a thick liquid, which uh, we find out later in the text is going to be called uh, naphtha. N uh, naphtha, sorry. Uh, so they get materials for a sacrifice. Uh, and Nehemiah tells the priest to sprinkle this thick liquid on the wood uh, as the things were being done for the sacrifice. And uh, the sun comes up, it shines uh, over this, and a great fire sets uh, on the sacrifices, over the, the, the sacrifices that this naphtha, this thick liquid, uh, had come upon. And uh, anyways, Nehemiah prays to God, and he says, he asks him to accept the sacrifice uh, and to gather all his scattered people, to set free slaves among the Gentiles, to look on those who are rejected and despised and let the Gentiles know that he is God and to punish those who oppress and are insolent with pride and plant your people in your holy place as Mo Moses promised. Now, this is all significant. Uh, it says that the priests sang hymns. Um, and then uh, he goes on and he goes back again once again, and he talks about how Jeremiah, uh, when he was, uh, when the people were being deported, they were being exiled to Babylon, uh, he had gone and he took the ark and all the furniture of the original, the first temple, uh, before the Babylonian exile, and he hid it away in a cave that nobody could find. Um, the Ark of the Covenant as well. So if you want a to follow a conspiracy theory, a very early Second Temple Jewish conspiracy theory, then the, you have that right there. Um, so he brings it there and he seals up the entrance. And then it says that some people followed him to mark the way, but they couldn't find it. Uh, and then when Jeremiah finds it, he rebukes them and he tells them the place shall remain hidden until God uh, gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. And the Lord uh, will disclose these things and the glory of the Lord in the cloud will appear as they were shown in the case of Moses. And as Solomon asked, the place should be specially consecrated. Uh, so then it go goes on to talk about how Solomon had offered up a dedication, a sacrifice for the dedication and completion of the temple. Uh, and in the same way, Moses prayed to uh, the Lord and fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifices. And in the same way, Solomon prayed and fire came down and consumed the whole burnt offerings. Uh, and uh, so anyways, it talks about how Solomon uh, was there for the eight days of the dedication of the temple. And uh, it says that the same things are reported in the records and in the memoirs of Nehemiah. And also he found a library and collected the books about the kings and the prophets and the writings of David, which seems to be a reference to the Tanakh and uh, letters of the kings about votive offerings. Uh, and then in the same way, Judas, Judah Maccabee also collected all the books that had been lost on account of the war that had come to us and they're in their possession. Um, so, 
there's a lot that's going on here. Pretty much, let me break down what's happening. Jeremiah, before the exile, no, actually, let me back up even further than that. What this text is claiming, and again, there's no actual historical ground. It's not like these people uh, had some history or some book that they were reading from that we don't uh, that that they had that we don't have. They didn't have any. They're, this is just them trying um, to give an explanation for how everything is how it used to be. In other words. When Moses, uh, who was the first person to uh, be there at the construction of the tabernacle and to be given the tabernacle blueprint on Sinai, uh, he offers up a sacrifice and God sends down fire and consumes that sacrifice and God, uh, his spirit comes as a cloud and it dwells in the tabernacle to show that God is really with them um, and he's living there in the tabernacle. And then he directly compares that to Solomon and how he built the first temple uh, which, you know, the tabernacle went from the tabernacle to the temple. Um, and Solomon prays and fire comes down from heaven and it consumes all the burnt offerings. Okay, so tabernacle, first temple, those are both uh, apparently uh, approved by God. Well, going on further, then he says that Nehemiah had, uh, well, priests... Uh, at the, well, first of all, Jeremiah had taken the Ark of the Covenant and all the the real furniture of the first temple, and he had taken them and hid it in a cave. And he says that even to his day, that that could not be found. That he's waiting on the Messiah to find that to bring it back and to restore the temple. Uh, he believes that there has to be the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it would be scandalous if there wasn't. Uh, Jeremiah, there's some verse in Jeremiah. I, you know, this is on me because I didn't look this up beforehand. But Jeremiah says something about the uh, how God dwells. He does not need to live inside some box uh, in the temple in the Ark of the Covenant. Though the Ark of the Covenant did symbolize his presence as long as it existed. It was probably stolen by the Babylonians whenever they took them into exile, as well as all the other gold furniture. Um, so... Anyways, but he is showing him as hiding all that for the later messianic era. But at the same time, he talks about how some priests had taken the fire. Remember, uh, a fire is kindled at the tabernacle. A fire is kindled at the first temple when Solomon is inaugurating it, Solomon Moses. And then these priests are taking fire from that original altar of the first temple before it's destroyed. They hide it in a cave. Um, and then these priests... Uh, when Nehemiah was leading uh, the whole uh, religious reform, leading people back into Israel to rebuild the second temple, he and other priests went to go find that fire, and they couldn't find it. But they found this naphtha, this pitch, and they took it, and they put it on a sacrifice, and guess what? God lights that, that sacrifice on fire. It is um, actually, what this is doing is it's showing the legitimacy of the uh, second temple and how that is just as legitimate as the first temple and just as legitimate as the tabernacle. Uh, and it talks about how uh, Nehemiah had founded the library uh, of the kings and the prophets and the writings of David. And then later he talks about how Judah had also collected all the books that had been lost on account of the war. So apparently there was there was something where these people were losing these books, losing the Tanakh, and Judah restored that. Um, so it's also uh, it, it, it is also um, really making a point about the significance of Judah Maccabee and him as kind of this uh, natural natural successor of Nehemiah. Uh, and Solomon and Moses and their work in uh, dedicating the tabernacle and the temple and the second temple. Well, now Judah Maccabee, he is going to go and he is going to cleanse out the second temple and he's going to reconstruct it after it had been profaned. He's going to tear down the parts that had been made unclean by the disaster and the uh, defilement that's going to take place in it and rebuild it. And this author believes that God is approving that and God approved the second temple. Now, uh, the second temple is not given the same amount of significance that this author is giving to it in the scriptures. In Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, this, when the second temple is being built, it says that the people uh, who saw it were, were clapping and cheering and applauding and they were all uh, shouting for joy. 
while all of those who had seen the first temple are weeping. Why are they weeping? They're weeping because it's nothing like the first temple. It's making an explicit claim about how this is not the same thing. Uh, and obviously, the authors of two Maccabees, living 400 years later, are, um, you know, they're ignorant of that. They have not seen the first temple, but they are very much in support of Judah Maccabee and what he did in rededicating the temple. And uh, they want to make a point there about that significance. And so they're arguing for that there and adding in this extra tradition that either they made up, they had been passed down uh, orally by other people, but it, it doesn't go back uh, to the beginning. In fact, this is not found in the scriptures. This is them coping uh, with the fact that they are living with the second temple. In fact, the end of the Tanakh, that is the Hebrew ordering of uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Ezra Nehemiah happens, there's uh, the second temple that's not the same as the first. And then you go to Chronicles, which has genealogies that goes all the way six generations past the exile, way past the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. However, uh, it's retelling the whole story of um, the Hebrew scriptures. And in fact, the very center of the Chronicles is talking about uh, Solomon and uh, him building the temple. And he prays to God that God, if, like this is such a popular, popular verse in Christianity. If God hears our, that God will hear our prayers, heal the land, bring the people back. This is written from an exilic perspective within a special um importance placed on uh, the temple and on the necessity for people to pray and ask God for God to bring the people back into Israel and restore them and rebuild the temple. Uh, there's all these details about the temple that are not given in the story of Kings uh, and, uh, and Samuel before, definitely not Samuel. David is also given a, a major part in playing for the temple and gathering all the resources for his son Solomon. Um, but the interesting thing about Chronicles is it does not end with Ezra and Nehemiah. The ordering for the Tanakh is Ezra and Nehemiah and then Chronicles. And at the end of Chronicles, it, it says that the king, is, uh, king Cyrus, Persia, tells uh, all the Jews, uh, let them go up. And it's, that's, that's it. It's not a finished sentence. But in Ezra and Nehemiah, you're told what he says. He says, let y'all, let the Jews go up to build their temple. Now, Chronicles, again, it's six generations afterwards, they have already seen the second temple, but they see that it's a disaster. It's not how things should have been. Uh, and so they are looking forward to a real restoration of uh, everything. And even Ezra and Nehemiah, Again, by saying that people are weeping at the building of the second temple, by showing how Nehemiah is going around pulling people's hair out at the end of the thing, you want to talk about a religious reform? Well, let's talk about a religious reform. You know, in even in Christianity, in Protestant Christianity, there is a significant amount of um, focus on Ezra and Nehemiah being the, the sort of manual or guide for how to lead a re religious reform. Well, let me tell you this, uh, a religious reform few religious forms, reforms are as bad as Ezra and Nehemiah's. I mean, you have John Calvin's Geneva, which is pretty, um, you know, but, uh, and you also have uh, all the Protestants as Martin Luther is in hiding and all the destruction that that brings. Anyways, uh, that's not the point. The point is, Ezra Nehemiah is not about how to lead a religious reform. The point is actually quite the opposite, that the people need to have a renewed heart. Uh, they need to have God's law written on their heart, and they need to be uh, revived and resurrected as uh, Ezekiel and as Jeremiah talk about. And in the same way that Protestant preachers today see Ezra Nehemiah as actually uh, having to, to an extent, in the way that they read it and talk about it being a, a real religious reform, they are um, kind of having the same type of reading as uh, two Maccabees here. So, anyways, um, I, I really hope that your pastors don't call ripping people's hair out and having to yell at people about observing the Sabbath a, a real religious reform. If they do, that's their own problem with reading the scriptures, not necessarily with their actual um, devotion to Jesus. But, that's the point that I'm saying is happening here with this uh, letter that's added on to the front end of two Maccabees.
So uh, then he jumps in and he says, uh, this is the story of Judas Maccabeus. Uh, I actually haven't mentioned this in this episode, but in the episode prior, uh, Judas Maccabeus is the Greek name for the same name in Hebrew, which is Judah the Maccabee. Maccabee just means hammer. Uh, it's because of his military power. He comes down and he hammers these people and he destroys them. Um, <coughs> so uh, it continues on. So uh, anyways, he says what he's going to be writing about. And um, uh, so it's about the story of Judah, Judah Maccabee and his brothers. Not really about his brothers, but anyways, about the purification of the great temple and the dedication of the altar and the further wars against Antiochus Epiphanes and his son uh, Eupatator, uh, and uh, the appearances that came from heaven to those who fought bravely for Judaism. That is not in one Maccabees, but it is all over two Maccabees. So that though few in number, they seized the whole land and pursued the barbarian hordes and regained possession of the temple, famous throughout the world, and liberated the city, and reestablished the laws, the Torah, that were about to be abolished, while the Lord, with great kindness, became gracious to them. That's a run-on sentence, if I've ever seen one. All this, which has been set forth by Jason of, uh, it seems like this should be read, Cyrene, I've, in, my, in the podcast I've listened to, which, by the way, you can find on my website, in Scholars and Sages, under Works and Writings, and MichaelJLight.com, uh, the podcast that I've listened to and the lectures I've listened to, they're all calling this Cyrene. Uh, it looks like it should be read Cyrene. I'll just call it Cyrene so I sound smart. Um, but all this has been set forth by Jason of Cyrene in five volumes. We shall attempt to condense it into a single book. Just, this is not that important, but uh, after about, I've read quite a bit of uh, Second Temple Jewish works, enough to know that texts at that time books for even 500 plus years after are not going to be bigger than 30 pages uh, of our English full packed pages. So when he says five volumes, um, you know, if we're talking about really full volumes, then that's going to be like five times 30, which is going to be 150 pages. So it's still a good sized book. Um, in our days, but uh, there you go. These are five books that this Jason of Cyrene had written, and this guy in two Maccabees is summarizing this. I read this, I was like, oh, that's awesome, the first time I read this, and I said, oh, I really want to read these five volumes later, um, but they have not survived. We don't have them, um, which is really disappointing. But we do have two Maccabees, and I love two Maccabees. It's my favorite of the Maccabees. Um, one Maccabees follows behind, but uh, one of those reasons is actually the appearances that come from heaven, which are freaking awesome. It's about uh, the attack of the angels, as you might call it. Um, but anyways, uh, it, it talks about uh, for the considering the flood of statistics involved and the difficulty there is for those who wish to enter upon the narratives of history because of the massive material. I just love how this guy says this. Um, he says, because of that, we have aimed to please those who wish to read, to make it easy for those who are inclined to memorize and to profit all readers. For us who have undertaken the toil of abbreviating, it is no light matter, but calls for sweat and loss of sleep, just as it is not easy for one who prepares a banquet and seeks the benefit of others. Nevertheless, to secure the gratitude of many, we will gladly endure the uncomfortable toil leaving the responsibility for exact details to the compiler without devoting our effort to arriving at the outlines of the condens uh, condensation. For just as the master builder of a new house must be concerned with the whole construction while the one undertakes its painting and decoration has to consider only what is suitable for its adornment, such in my, uh, in my judgment is the case with us. It is the duty of the original historian to occupy the ground, to discuss matters from every side, and to take trouble with details. But the one who recasts the narrative should be allowed to strive for brevity of expression and to forego exhaustive treatment. At this point, therefore, let us begin our narrative without adding any more to what has already been said, for it would be foolish to lengthen the preface while cutting short the history itself. So, that is... The introduction to to Maccabees. I, I just I, I love this text. I love uh, the apocalyptic element that it adds to one Maccabees, the, the straight historicism of one Maccabees, and there is a, a little bit of um, 
exaggeration, which I actually enjoy, uh, 2 Maccabees just bumps that up. It adds in these angels that are uh, coming in in aid of the those who are faithful to God to attack uh, those that are um, trying to oppress the Jews. And I just think it's just epic. Uh, so anyways, uh, the first couple chapters, up until about chapter, I want to say five, it's a little slow. Chapters one and two are pretty epic. Uh, even though I don't believe that the traditions are scriptural, as in not only did the events not happen and are ahistorical, but they even um, go against what scripture seems to be saying, and the authors seem to be coping with what actually did happen, uh, it, it's it's interesting and it's fun to read nonetheless. Uh, but with all, all that being said, uh, it, it begins... The story uh, begins, and it talks about this high priest, Onias. Now, um, I believe this is Onias III, um, but uh, also this is actually the same Onias that is talked about in The Wisdom of Jesus, Son of Syra. If you haven't listened to that podcast episode, it's already up. If you'd rather just read a brief introduction, it's already on my website. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, a lot of faithful Jews in that time, had a high view of this guy. Um, and it talks about his faithfulness and how he follows all the Torah of God and how because of his faithfulness, uh, the whole city, Jerusalem, is at peace and it's glorified. However, that does not last but a couple of verses. Uh, this all quickly takes a turn when someone named Simon is introduced and he is at odds with Onias. Uh, he has an argument with him about something. Um, and in fact, they don't come to an agreement. Uh, rather, he goes to tell a local governor that, hey, the temple has a bunch of funds, uh, a lot of money, and you can go and uh, go ahead and get your, your hands on that. Um, and this local governor, his name is Apollinus. And uh, these funds are actually funds for sacrifices, um, but he tells him that he could take them for himself. And so uh, Apollinus sends for someone named Heliodorus to enter into the temple and take the funds for himself. Uh, so you can already see how this one guy, um, Simon, who's trying to take the high, who's, who's angry because he can't have things his own way with the, the faithful high priest that the author of Two Maccabees has no problem sharing his opinion about, uh, that is, well, that automatically leads to this uh, selfish, um, unfaithful Jew going and telling somebody to steal money for sacrifices. You can tell whatever it was that they got in an argument about. Simon was not on the good side, and he's going to be the one that, that brings just so much. So, um, this guy Heliodorus comes to the temple, and uh, he thinks that he's going to just uh, walk right in. Um, but the whole city is brought to distress. Uh, the priests prostrated themselves before the altar in their priestly vestments and called toward heaven upon him who had given the law about deposits that he should keep them safe for those who had deposited to them. To see the appearance of the high priest was to be wounded at heart for his face and the change in his color uh, disclosed the anguish of his soul. For terror and bodily trembling had come over man, which plainly showed to those who looked at him, and uh, the pain lodged in his heart. People is coming out of their houses in crowds, um, and they are praying that uh, the temple might be protected. Uh, women are girded with sackcloth under their breasts, thronged the streets. Uh, some of the young women uh, who were kept on doors, they run together to the gates, and some to the walls, and others are peering out of windows. And everybody is praying to heaven that this guy Heliodorus, this Gentile, does not enter into the temple. Again, remember, in the Torah, only on the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that one day a year, could the high priest enter into the temple. Um, but here, this Gentile who's supposed to be kept at the outer gate, is trying to watch right in to uh, get the funds. And so these people see this as a big trouble. Um, first of all, if this guy gets screwed, then what are the Gentiles going to think? 
we'll see later that the Gentiles just quickly assume when there's uh, something going on in Jerusalem that it's a problem with the Jews and there's, there's stuff brought upon all of them. And they've been at peace to this moment because of uh, the faithfulness of Onias. What's going to happen when this Gentile guy gets uh, destroyed for entering into the temple? Well, you find out pretty quickly. Because while they were calling upon the Almighty Lord, this is verse 22 of chapter 3, uh, while they were calling upon the Almighty Lord that he would keep what had been entrusted safe and secure for those who had entrusted it, Heliodorus went on with uh, what had been decided. He decided to keep on going. Uh, he comes to the treasury um, and uh, with his bodyguard. That, and then and there, the sovereign of spirits and of all authority caused so great a manifestation that all who had been so bold as to accompany him were astounded by the power of God and became faint with terror. So these guys just fall down into fear. Uh, for there appeared to them a magnificently ca uh, caparisoned uh, horse, Harrison, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Anyways, uh, with a rider of frightening mind, it rushed furiously at Heliodorus and struck at him with its front hooves. Its rider was seen to have armor and weapons of gold. Two young men also appeared to him remarkably strong, gloriously beautiful, and splendidly dressed, who stood on either side of him and flogged him continuously, inflicting many blows on him. When he suddenly fell to the ground and deep darkness came over him, his men took him up, put him on a stretcher, and carried him away. And yeah, this guy gets absolutely screwed by these angelic charioteers that come down and destroy him. So he lays down uh, prostrate, speechless, uh, because of what he had just seen. Um, and they praise God. And uh, anyways, everybody is in fear. Because this guy just got screwed. He's a Gentile. And what's going to happen to the Jews when they find out? Uh, but they're also filled with joy and gladness uh, that God had saved him and possibly all of the Jews by not having the temple. Also, the temple would be defiled. It would be made unclean because that's going against the Torah. So, um, anyways, Heliodorus' friends come to beg Onias to pray for God to give him life. Uh, so, <laughs> this is what it says, the high priest, fearing that the king might get the notion that some foul play had been pro perpetrated by the Jews with regard to Heliodorus. So, you see, like, they were afraid, when this guy Heliodorus gets screwed, we're all screwed. So, he offers a sacrifice for the man's recovery, and uh, he makes atonement. There you go. That is, it's sec two Maccabees uh, really lays on the significance of atonement and how there needs to be, um, yeah, there needs to be atonement for purification. And, uh, you know, these are ideas that are already found in the scriptures, but two Maccabees brings it out like no other text. And it's awesome. This is not where it is. Uh, I mean, this is cool, but this is nothing like what goes on later. Uh, and so these, uh, these angels say to Heliodorus, it doesn't call them angels, but you're just supposed to assume so. They say, be very grateful to the high priest Onias, since for the sake, for his sake, the Lord has granted your life and see that you who have been flogged by heaven report to all people, the majestic power of God. And they disappear. So, uh, Helio Heliodorus offers a sacrifice to God. Uh, he makes great vows to the savior of his life. And uh, he says, thanks and bye to Onias. So uh, he goes and tells everybody that that happens. And when the king asks him, uh, who would be a good person to send on another mission to Jerusalem? Heliodorus says, if you have any enemy or plotter against your government, send him there. For you will get him back thoroughly flogged if he survives at all. For there is certainly some power of God about this place. Uh, I think that's just such an awesome, I can just imagine him with his eyes wide open, shook, telling Antiochus, dude, send somebody there and this guy is going to be absolutely destroyed. Um, so anyways, the Simon that had been mentioned previously, um, he goes on and he says, uh, he makes a lie saying that uh, the problem was not with Heliodorus. In fact, guess who he blames it all on? Onias, the faithful priest who actually saved the guy's life. 
Um, and it says that he even tried to commit murders to have this guy dead. Who knows what actually happened there? Um, like uh, how he tried that and how that failed. But anyways, Onias sees that this is not very good. So he lets the king know so that he doesn't get screwed. Um, and so anyways, Seleucus dies, uh, who, who's apparently the king. And Antiochus, Epiphanes, uh, becomes the next king. Oh, yeah. You know what's going to happen. Um, so, uh, anyways, this guy named Jason, who's actually Onias' brother, uh, obtained the high priesthood by corruption, um, and he promises the king a whole bunch of money. Now, the name Jason is the Greek version of the name John. Uh, so John is like the Hebrew form and Jason the Greek. So you can already tell this guy is giving up the, the Jewish life. He's giving up a Hebrew name to take on a Greek name to, uh, as it's going to say, take the Greek hat. Uh, he's becoming Greek and he's trying to buy the high priesthood, which is ironic because the high priest is supposed to be the most, the, the pious person that represents uh, Israel to God. Yet he's apostatizing, denying God, becoming Greek in culture, uh, and then trying to buy the high priesthood that could not be bought. Um, and the guy, Antiochus, just gives it to him. And uh, he promises to pay even more money if they can uh, build a gymnasium uh, and get the people from Jerusalem to start going to it. Remember, a gymnasium is not just like some Planet Fitness where lunk alerts are kicked out. That's not the bad thing. The bad thing happening here is uh, gymnasiums were uh, Greek centers where people would go and... Uh, talk, and I think there was some philosophy done there uh, as well, but uh, more importantly, there was also a bunch of naked people running around exercising. Now, uh, if you're a Jew, if you're a naked Jewish man, there's something that stands out about you. You're circumcised. Uh, so, one Maccabees talks about the fact that whenever this gymnasium is built, and it lays emphasis on the fact that it's built in the same city as the temple, Jerusalem, um, people start having surgery to become uncircumcised. Again, don't ask me. I don't know, um, and I'm not going to look it up. I imagine it's painful, and it's really screwed up. One way or another, they're apostatizing. They're giving up the law. Um, so, uh, anyways, uh, it goes on. He has that built, and uh, he is introducing everybody to the Greek life. And uh, people are giving up faithfulness to the Torah on that very account. And it says that the priests are no longer even attent, intent upon their service at the altar. They despised the sanctuary, neglected the sacrifice, and they went to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the wrestling arena, naked wrestling arena, might I add, after the signal for the discus throwing, naked discus throwing. Um, their people are giving up the Jewish way of life. And it only goes from bad to worse. In fact, for the next couple of chapters, it's just going to be declining. So, uh, as if it wasn't bad enough with Jason buying the high priesthood, three years later, Menelaus um, ups his game and promises even more money. So Jason uh, now doesn't have the high priesthood because he got outbidded. Um, and so after the, receiving the king's orders, uh, he returned, possessing no qualification for the high priesthood, but having the hot temper of a cruel tyrant and the rage of a savage wild beast. Uh, so after supplanting his own brother and being supplanted by another man, he's driven as a fugitive into the land of Ammon. And he will return, and he will cause more havoc. But until then, Menelaus uh, continues to hold the office, uh, giving none of the money that he promised uh, to the king. Um... And he even uh, sends somebody named Andronicus uh, to go kill Onias. And uh, he goes, shows up all peacefully, uh, makes a pledge to him, and then kills him. Well, the nations are so enraged about this uh, that the king uh, sends somebody to go and kill the person who killed Onias uh, for that. Uh, so, pretty much, if you couldn't see, things are just going from bad to worse. And boy, do they get worse. So this Menelaus, it's then found out that some of the golden vessels of the temple are being stolen. 
the people are pretty ticked off about this and they're throwing uh, wooden blocks and stones at them and ashes at them um and menelaus is about to be put on trial and guess what he pays off the king and uh he's let go as if nothing had ever happened anyways uh antiochus had earlier gone into egypt to take it and uh he comes again and uh it says and it happened that for almost 40 days there appeared over all the city golden clad cavalry charging through the air in companies fully armed with lances and drawn swords troops of cavalry drawn up attacks and counterattacks made on this side and on that brandishing of shields and massing of spears hurling of missiles uh the flash of golden trappings and armor of all kinds therefore everyone prayed that the apparition might prove to have been a good omen so pretty much they see uh these moving uh fighting angels uh up in the sky uh and when a false rumor arose that antiochus was dead there's this lie that's going around that antiochus is dead now that he's in egypt jason the guy who had ran away uh comes back and uh he makes an assault on the city and he slaughters uh literally i think it's thousands of his own people he's slaughtering his own people um and uh, he's coming in to take back jerusalem but when king antiochus hears about this of the war that jason is waging because guess what antiochus is not done um within the total of three days eighty thousand were destroyed uh 40,000 in hand-to-hand combat fighting, as many were sold into slavery as were killed. Uh, after, that is, Antiochus comes raging from Egypt uh, to take the city by storm. And uh, he tells the soldiers to cut people down uh, recklessly. Then Antiochus goes and enters into the temple. Um, and he takes the holy vessels with his polluted hands He's a Gentile, so uh, his hands are richly impure, and he takes it anyways. And um, he takes the votive offerings, uh, and he's elated. He's happy uh, that the Lord, uh, it says, and Antiochus was elated in spirit. This is uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Antiochus was elated in spirit and did not perceive that the Lord was angered for a little while because of the sins of those who lived in the city and that this was the reason he was disregarding the holy place. Now, um, oh, I actually really love what it continues to say, so I'm, I'm going to read this. This is so awesome. Uh, but if it had not happened that they were involved in many sins, this man would have been flogged and turned back from his rash act as soon as he came forward, just as Heliodorus had uh, been, whom King Seleucus sent to inspect uh, the treasury. But the Lord did not choose the nation for the sake of the holy place, but the place for the sake of the nation. Therefore, the place itself shared the misfortunes that befell the nation and afterward participated in its benefits. And what was forsaken in the wrath of the Almighty was restored again in all its glory when the great Lord became reconciled. Now, the great reconciliation of the Lord is not going to come without the shedding of innocent blood. Uh, as Hebrews 9.22 says, uh, which is a later Christian account. Uh, but uh, also, so a couple things to know. Real quick, I'm just going to make a, a New Testament um, connection here that uh, I'm actually reading from the Oxford, the New Oxford Annotated Apocrypha uh, based on the NRSV. It's an ecumenical study Bible, the fifth edition. And Daniel R. Schwartz is uh, the annotator for two Maccabees. Um, and this is uh, the first of his uh, comments that I'm going to point out. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, I saw it on my own anyways, but I just want to give credit uh, where credit might even be due. Uh, but he, he connects this to the passage like Mark 2, 27, where Jesus says that um, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was not made for man. This is very similar to the thinking that the Lord did not choose the nation for the sake of the holy place, but the place for the sake of the nation. 
And I think that's quite profound, especially in light of the uh, importance that the earlier letter, which now that I think about it, was probably appended onto this work, uh, seems to put on the fact that the second temple must be in the same league as the tabernacle and the first temple, and that God is continuing um, to support the second temple in the same way as the others. Um, but this here is talking about uh, God's relationship with his people. And um, it's not about him protecting the temple when all his people are being destroyed. Thousands of, hundreds of thousands of Jews have just been killed or sold off into slavery. And God's concern is not just with the temple. God's concern is with his people. Now, the reason his people are being slaughtered and destroyed is because they had been faithless. The reason that Heliodorus is sent away from the temple, uh, scourged by these um, angels that, are, uh, that come down and destroy him, is because Onias is faithful. And uh, a lot of Israel is faithful. They're all coming out to pray and ask God uh, to come and uh, to protect his temple. And he does that. And he, he shows this fool what he just did. Um, and that's when Israel was being faithful. Well, then these few people, this guy Jason corrupts many. He leads many astray. And even though there are some faithful in Israel, because of the faithful faithlessness of so few, it brings about death and destruction through a series of events that just spirals out of control, more and more out of control. And uh, because of the faithlessness, uh, my interpretation, and I haven't heard uh, from the podcasts and um, from the lectures and from the, the reading and the annotations, I haven't seen a mention of this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that what's happening actually, when it talks about the golden clad army and they're fighting up in the skies and how they hope that that's a good omen, that what's happening there is very similar to what we see in uh, Daniel chapter, I want to say 11, where anyways, Daniel, is, uh, he's, he's been fasting and praying for 40 days, 40 days, and the, the angel Gabriel comes to him and he says, uh, we were at war, the prince of... Israel and the Prince of Persia, and we were we were at war for many days. Otherwise, we would have seen you earlier. Um, so I think what he's doing there is uh, this author of two Maccabees is actually saying um, that when we, when we sacrifice ourselves and and fasting is a sort of giving up our own life, giving up uh, the source of life, food, um, to seek God, the true source of all life, um, and, uh, and and prayer. And notice how. God is going to be showing up throughout two Maccabees in a response to prayer. Um, and so, uh, what can be said here? Um, but that the, the author of two Maccabees is uh, doing some really good theology here. Oh, man, I, I love it because it's interesting, but I love it because it's also, uh, after that interesting, but nonetheless uh, a biblical letter, uh, the rest of two Maccabees is making a lot of really good points. Um, it's making the point that there there's a war that's happening up uh, in the skies, as you might say, um, that is, uh, uh, how do you say this, compared parallel to the war that's happening in Israel among the, the faithful and the faithless, the faithless persecuting the faithful. And as we'll see later, these angels are going to come down uh, to fight with Israel again once again, not just for them, but with them, as uh, the death of the, the faithful atones and reconciles God. And this is looking forward to the reconciliation of the Lord. And it says that when the Lord is reconciled, then he's going to restore them in all their glory again. And it's about the people and not the place here. And man, I, I just think there's so much to unpack here. I think that's just awesome. So anyways, what it's saying is the reason Antiochus could enter, but not Heliodorus, is because the sins of Israel, again, it comes from that Deuteron uh, Deutero Deuteronomist uh, sort of view, so as to say. Um, so he takes off all this money from the temple and uh, it, to Antioch, and uh, he it talks about how his arrogance and uh, the army that he sends there, and he waits till the Holy Sabbath day, and then he finds Jews not at work, and he orders his troops uh, to destroy them uh, on the Sabbath. And this is talked about in 1 Maccabees. And in 1 Maccabees, it talks about Mattathias uh, calling faithful Jews to go out into the desert um, and to flee this, and him encouraging his sons right before he dies, one of them being uh, Judah Maccabee. And he talks about the others as well. But 
Uh, in this, it doesn't talk about Mattathias. In fact, it just says, Judah Maccabee, with about nine others, got away into the wilderness and kept himself with his companions alive in the mountains as wild animals do. They continued to live on what grew wild so that they might not share in the defilement. Um, so, not long after this, uh, the king sent an Athenian senator to compel the Jews to forsake the law the laws of their ancestors, and no longer to live by the laws of God, and to pollute the temple in Jerusalem, and to call it the temple of Olympian Zeus, and to call the one in Gerizim, that's a temple in Samaria, the temple of Zeus, uh, the friends of strangers, as did the people who lived in the place. Oh, actually, um, one very interesting thing that uh, I passed by that I, I want to make a note of Um when it comes to John chapter 4, uh, it, it talks about, uh, I, I believe that's the story of the, the woman at the well, where Jesus uh, goes through Samaria while his apostles, the disciples go around. I think there was a much, there was a low view of Samaritans, but not so much as uh, a lot of people make it out to be. Um, and we see that here in this text. And I was actually surprised to find this myself, is that, uh, in uh, chapter 5, ver five verse 22, it says, He left governors to oppress the people at uh, Jerusalem, Philip, by birth, uh, Phrygian, I don't know how to say that, and in character more barbarous than the man who appointed him, and at Gerizim, Andronicus, and besides these, Mel uh, Men uh, Menelaus, who lorded it over his compatriots worse than the others did, and malice toward the Jewish citizens. So, man, I, I, I just really find that uh, very interesting that uh, Gerizim, a place in Samaria, is also mentioned. Like, this is something that's also happening to the Jews, where the, uh, the Jews are being persecuted in, in Gerizim as well. The Samaritans, they're grouping the Samaritans with the Jews and their persecutions together. Uh, and e even the annotator here notes this. He says the author con considers Samaritans to be Jews, although they worshipped at a different temple on Mount Gerizim. Uh, and uh, Deuteronomy says to only worship in uh, the temple uh, at, at the Temple Mount, uh, and so that's interesting as well. But I think that uh, even though a lot of Jews had a lower view of Samaritans than they had of other Jews, and some definitely just uh, totally despised them, we can't make this broad sweeping statement that all Jews just totally despised them. Um, if we want to be historically fair to them. Um, and so, anyways, uh, it, it says that the author's uh, I even-handedness reflects the situation of diaspora Jews who worshipped at neither. So, in other words, what he's saying is this uh, author recognizes that there are Jews sent out all throughout the world, and they don't all necessarily have the same access to the temple. And so... Worshipping at Gerizim, they also see that as legit. And they note that Antiochus, at least according to him, called the temple that was in Gerizim the Temple of Zeus, the friend of strangers. Um, and uh, so, anyways, uh, he, he's at least sympathetic towards Samaritans. So, uh, it talks about uh, the temple being filled with debauchery and reveling by the Gentiles who dallied with prostitutes and had intercourse with women within the sacred precincts and besides thought in things for sacrifice that were unfit. They brought in things for sacrifice that were unfit. The altar was covered with abominable offerings that were forbidden by the Jews. This is uh, a lot of people think this is referring to pigs uh, at, at the very least, if not also other things. <clears throat> People could neither keep the Sabbath, nor observe the festivals of their ancestors, nor so much as confess themselves to be Jews. Um, and so, on the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, yay, it's your month anniversary of, the birth of your birthday, the Jews were taken under bender constraint to partake of the sacrifices. And when the festival of D uh, Dionysus was celebrated, they were compelled to wear wreaths of ivy, uh, and to walk in the procession in honor of uh, D Dionysus. And uh, so also Ptolemaeus, 
uh, suggested that a decree to the neighboring Greek cities that they should also adopt the same policy towards the Jews and to make them partake of this uh, um, of the sacrifices. Uh, and so this is apparently even uh, going even further. And so these Jews uh, are not only not allowed to obey the Sabbath, not allowed to obey uh, the, the law, the Torah, um, or the festivals, which is important because this book uh, lays a special significance on following uh, the festivals. The Gentiles have destroyed the, they have just made the temple unbelievably evil. They have uh, prostitutes there, they're sleeping with people there, they're getting drunk there, they're getting lit, uh, they're making it a temple to Zeus, they're offering up pigs on the altar, and it is horrific. And it says that they should kill those who chose not to change over to the Greek customs. This is also also all at the beginning of verse uh, of chapter six. I started in verse one, uh, and so uh, for example, it says two women were brought in for having some circumcised their children. They publicly paraded them around the city with their babies hanging at their breasts, and then hurled them down headlong from the wall. And then people come to celebrate the seventh day secretly, and they're betrayed and they're burned together. Um, uh, because their piety kept them from defending themselves in view of their regard for the most holy day. So, you don't think it can get any worse? Guess what it does. Um, and uh, if you couldn't tell, uh, it's going to get worse uh, by what's how it's already been getting worse when you just keep on thinking it can't. Uh, the author leaves a, uh, a note to say, I urge you, this is uh, chapter 6, verse 12, and I urge those who read this book not to be depressed by such calamities, but to recognize that these punishments were designed not to destroy, but to discipline our people. Again, because the people had sinned. <clears throat> he said, in fact, it is a sign of great kindness not to let the impious alone for long, but to punish them immediately. For in the case of other nations, the Lord waits pa patiently to punish them until they have reached the full measure of their sins. But he does not deal in this way with us in order that he may not take vengeance on us afterward when our sins have reached their height. And uh, the author of two Maccabees, by the way, has a very high view of the resurrection <coughs> that is going to come out all throughout. Therefore, he uh, never withdraws his mercy from us. Uh, although he disciplines us with calamities, he does not forsake his own people. Uh, let what we have said serve as a reminder. We must go on briefly with the story. Now, I'm going to warn you. Uh, first of all, the other stuff is like, that's shocking and that's disturbing. Um, but if that's hard to bear, uh, chapter 6, verse 18, through uh, the 42 chapters, 42 verses of chapter 7 are intense. If you like it, it, if you are scared of dying for something, uh, for like uh, you know, for your faith, or for something, and like man, this is these are the chapters to turn to. I, I think these are just the most epic martyr stories that I have ever read. They just get they just absolutely get you going. Um, so there's this priest, this old priest named Eliezer. And uh, they're forcing him to open his mouth to eat swine's flesh. Uh, but it says that, but he, welcoming death with honor rather than life with pollution, went up to the rack of, to be tortured to death of his own accord, and he spat out the flesh. So they're forcing this man's mouth open like there's nothing they can do. They're physically forcing it open. He, he walks up to the execution rack, spits that crap out, and uh, he's pretty much asking for himself to die um, because that's the only thing that's going to happen if you're going to be faithful to the Torah. Um, so anyway, those who are in charge of that unlawful sacrifice took the man aside because of their long acquaintance with him and privately urged him to bring meat of his own providing, proper for him to use, and to pretend that he was eating the flesh of the sacrificial meal that had been commanded by the king. So uh, they say, hey, you know, why don't you just eat other meat, and then just pretend, like, eat, eat meat that you actually are allowed to eat, right? Why don't you just get, like, some beef, eat that, and then say, oh, yeah, I was eating the swine. But look at how this guy responds. Um, 
he this guy responds um, they say do this so that you might be saved from death uh, and uh, but it says in verse 23 but making a high resolve worthy of his years and the dignity of his old age and the gray hairs that he had reached with distinction and his excellent life even from childhood and moreover according to the holy god-given law he declared himself quickly telling them to send him to hades uh which is like hell so he says no i won't even act like i'm going to uh disobey the torah uh even though i'm old I'm not going to act like I'm going to disobey the Torah. Uh, and he literally tells them to send him to hell. He says, such pretense is, uh, in, you know, when I say hell, I'm talking about death, where the righteous and the unrighteous went with the hope of resurrection, as we're going to see in this. He says, verse 24, such pretense is not worthy of our time of life. For many of the young might suppose that Eliezer in his 90th year had gone over to an alien religion. And through my pretense, for the sake of living a brief moment longer, they would be led astray because of me, while I defile and disgrace my old age. Even for the present, I would avoid the punishment of mortals, yet whether I live or die, I will not escape the hands of the Almighty. Therefore, by bravely giving up my life now, I will show myself worthy of my old age, and leave to the young a no uh, young a noble example of how to die a good healthy willing and nobly for the revered and holy laws and when he said this he went up at once to the rack um, and those who a little before had acted toward him with goodwill now changed to ill will because of the words that he uttered um, and as he's about to die under the blows he groans aloud and he says it's clear to the lord and his holy knowledge that though i might have been saved from death uh, I am enduring terrible sufferings in my body under this beating, but in my soul I am glad to suffer these things because I fear him. And in, in this way he died, leaving in his death an example of nobility and a memorial of courage, not only to the young man, but to the great body of his nation. It doesn't stop there. There's a whole chapter afterwards. Now, I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to share, like, I, I would love to read this whole chapter. Man, like, if you're ever afraid of people getting on you for anything, like, this chapter is insane. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll just summarize it real quick right here. Um, there are seven sons of a mother, and these sons are all uh, fully grown, is the assumption. Um, and uh, none of these are named, by the way. Uh, they are such, like, they are held by such high uh revere by the early church that they come to have names and they're canonized as saints uh, as you might say and they have their own feasts as you know the dropping of the needle of the pope has in uh the church calendar but uh so these guys are going to be tortured um if they don't uh, i believe it's also eat swine uh but anyways it's this mother and her grown seven sons and they're taken together um, and, uh, pretty much one by one, starting with the oldest, the oldest son, he says, uh, why don't you eat this, uh, this flesh, this swine flesh? I'll, I'll, well, I'll read what the first one says. He says, the Lord God is watching over us and in truth has compassion on us. As Moses declared in his song that bore witness against the people to their faces when he said, and he will have compassion on his servants. And after he dies, um, they bring forth the second and they say, are you going to eat this? Uh, or are you going to be punished limb by limb? And he says, no. And in his last breath, he says, you accursed wretch, you dismiss us with a present life, but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. Uh, so that's a, that is a, um, very, uh, demonstrable, quote that shows that this author believes in the resurrection as do many other um so anyways they quickly um uh, and this is not pg in case you haven't told been told uh if if you're not into gruesome stories you need to skip these chapters and you probably need to skip five minutes further into the podcast but they pull out this guy's tongue and uh he stretches forth his hands and says I, uh, oh, sorry, this is the third son. Uh, they, he puts, 
When it was demanded, I'm sorry, when he, it was demanded, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands and said nobly, I got these from heaven, and because of his laws, I, uh, um, I'm so sorry. He said, I got these from heaven, and because of his laws, I disdain them, and from him I hope to get them back again. And so uh, the king is astonished at him, and because he suffers as if it's nothing. Uh, and he says, uh, when he's near death, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of mortals and to cherish the hope of God, the hope God gives of being raised by him again. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life. He just boldly tells him to his face. So anyways, this goes down through all the, uh, all the children. And then uh, at the end, they come to the, to the youngest son and uh, they tell him, Hey, all your older brothers died. Are you going to die the same death? Or are you going to save your life and just eat the silly piece of meat? Um, and they're really trying to get him to save his life. But leaning close to him, uh, the mom speaks in their native tongue in Hebrew and tells him this in verse 27. My son, have pity on me. I have carried you nine months in my womb and nursed you for three month years <clears throat> And have reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you. I beg you, my child, to look at heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. That's like pretty much the first statement of ex nihilo, that God created everything from uh, nothing because the Greeks believed that it was made out of the four elements of fire, earth, air, and water. Um, and she says it's made out of no substances. So pretty much she says, I gave birth to you. I nurse you. I, I beg you, my child, to look at heaven and earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. And in the same way, the human race came into being. Do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death so that in God's mercy, I may get you back along with your brothers. And so this guy says, what are you waiting for? I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to obey the law that was given to us by Moses. And uh, you are not going to escape the hands of God. Uh, we are suffering for our own sins. And if our living Lord is angry for a little while to rebuke and discipline us, he will again be reconciled with his own servants. Again, remember that it said that God would be reconciled. God, God did not destroy Antiochus who's the person punishing him right now when he entered the temple because of the sins of the people but when God is reconciled to them again then he will and the reconciliation is pointed out as this in this by this author as being connected to this to the death of these sons so this guy uh, he jumps up on the rack and he says yeah kill me kill me bud and this king is enraged and he destroys him and then after that uh, he destroys the mother after she had just seen all of her, uh, all of her sons die before her eyes. And then this guy just says, let this be enough then about the, uh, the eating of sacrifices and the extreme tortures. So, um, up until that point, everything had just gone from the faithful Nias in like three verses to everything just goes absolutely terrible out of control. And then in chapter 8, all this takes a turn. It says, let that be enough. And then chapter 8, verse 1, the next verse. Meanwhile, Judas, who is also called Maccabeus, and his companions secretly entered the villages, some of their kindred, and enlisted those who continued in the Jewish faith. And so they gathered 6,000. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be honest, the, the last half, uh, you know, Jesus, Judas, he gets these 6,000 men, he goes out to war and he's defeating Gentiles battle after battle. Now this this next half, right, that talks about the rise of Judah Maccabee and the restoration of Israel is epic. In my opinion, <clears throat> the sum of two Maccabees is in the martyr stories. They're just so awesome. So um, anyways, I'll, I will be a lot more sparing in details. Uh, I just love, I, I love this stuff so much. It's so, this is just some of, some of the greatest. Um, so he, he comes back, he gathers the Jews. For, well, first they actually pray to God. Um, and 
So he's, he's come back. He was hiding in the hills. They pray to God to restore the temple that had been corrupted um, and to respond to the death of those who had died faith uh, in faith, <clears throat> to have mercy on the, the city that was being destroyed and about to be leveled to the ground and to hearken to the blood that cried out to them is what it says in chapter 8, verse 3. So, in other words, it was the blood of these martyrs that was going to make reconciliation to God. And notice it's crying out to God. Think of Genesis chapter 4, where Abel's righteous blood cries out to God. Uh, Think of uh, Exodus chapter uh, 2, that talks about the blood of uh, the Israelites crying out to God. Uh, Or no, that's just the Israelites. But the point is... uh, these martyrs were seen as atonement for Israel. And uh, they pray, and this is the turning point. The turning point is after these, the death of these righteous people who are faithful to the Torah. Um, and so uh, Judah Maccabee goes out to battle. The governor notices him and sends Nicanor to destroy him. And while many of his men, uh, while many... Uh, I'm so sorry. So, uh, well, yeah, while many of Judah Maccabees, I'm, I'm reading my notes here. Uh, while many of Judah Maccabees men leave in fear, he, Judah Maccabee is encouraging them uh, to fight for God. They crush Nicanor's army and send him running away. Uh, and he warns uh, King Antiochus that God is fighting for Judah. Uh, he says, uh, um, so Judah Maccabee is when he encourages them, he's telling them to re- to remember that they trust in the they do not trust in uh, arms and acts of daring, but in God Almighty, who with a single nod can strike down those who are coming to us, even if necessary, the whole world. And he tells them uh, of the time of their ancestors and of the time of Sennacherib, when one hundred eighty five thousand died, uh, and he uses that as his encouragement. And uh, then, I just think that this is so awesome. So, uh, this guy, Nicanor, had been humbled. And uh, he uh, goes away, and uh, he's sent away out of fear. And, uh, let's see. It says, So he who had undertaken to secure tribute for the Romans by the capture of the people of Jerusalem proclaimed that the Jews had a defender and that therefore the Jews were invulnerable because they followed uh, the laws ordained by him. And then it says, okay, now this is awesome. You're rem- if you had listened to the last podcast on 1 Maccabees, you'll remember that Antiochus hears that Judah Maccabee is being successful and uh, he gets sick with disappointment and on his... Uh, sick bed he dies he literally dies of disappointment um but this is even more awesome uh, because uh th- this is a you know one and two maccabees vary on a couple things uh in this account uh antiochus um he's put to flight he's beat in a shameful retreat uh when he went to persia now remember uh, the opening where it talks about how he went to the temple to marry the goddess. <coughs> he's humiliated and he's angry. And uh, he thinks, hmm, what about those Jews? I can do injury to them. Uh, and so he tells his charioteer to drive without stopping until he completed the journey. Uh, but it says, but the judgment of heaven rode with him. For in his arrogance, he said, when I get there, I will make Jerusalem a cemetery of Jews. Yikes. Now again, remember that statement, God uh, let, only let Antiochus enter the temple because of the sins of the Jews. But when God was uh, reconciled, things weren't going to be like that. And what is the thing that stands in between this? The blood crying out of these martyrs and uh, Judah Maccabee uh, praying to God. So the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel, struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. As soon as he stopped speaking, he was seized with the pain of his bowels, <laughs> um, and for which there was no relief, and with sharp internal tortures. 
and that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange inflictions. Now, uh, in the ancient times, this sounds weird, but in the ancient times, it wasn't really uh, your head that did the thinking. Well, in Greek th thought it was, but uh, my understanding is that the bowels was where uh, were kind of like the seat of your conscience, so as to say. And so he had, so you might imagine if there is a place where your uh, conscience takes place, that's your bowels. And so that's why God attacks his bowels is because he had offended and defiled the, uh, the conscience of so many other peoples. And yet he did not in any way stop his insolence. He keeps on going, even though he's got that sharp attack in his bowels and he's probably um, pooping himself. Uh, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Uh, thus he was only a little while before he thought in his superhuman arrogance that he would could command the waves of the sea and that he had imagined uh, he could weigh the high mountains in the balance, was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, uh, making the power of God manifest to all. And so the ungodly man's body is swarmed with worms, and while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away, and because of the stench, the whole army felt uh, revulsion at its decay. Because of intolerable stench, no one was able to carry the man uh, who a little while before had the thought that he could touch the stars of heaven. Uh, by the way, I'm not going to get into this, but uh, go read Isaiah uh, chapter 14 that talks about um, the sun of the morning star. Definitely a reference here as it's talking about the king of Babylon and uh, the spiritual evil that's uh, talking above that. Um, uh, again, it's God who's done this, uh, who attacks him with this uncurable disease. He's broken in spirit and uh, it says that he... Uh, began to lose much of his arrogance and to come to his senses under the scourge of God, for he was tortured with pain every moment. And when he could not endure his own stench, he uttered these words, It is right to be subject to God. Mortals should not think that they are equal to God. And then he, this abominable fellow made a vow to the Lord who would no longer have mercy on him, stating that the holy city, which he was hurrying to level to the ground and to make a cemetery, he was now declaring to be free. And then he writes to the Jews... Uh, pretty much uh, an apology video, if you've ever seen those. Uh, like, hey, I'm sorry, uh, as my hope is in heaven, I remember with uh, affection your esteem and goodwill. Uh, I was a big jerk. Uh, I messed up. Um, yeah, you guys can uh, have, you guys can have the temple land again. Um, you guys can have Jerusalem, uh, which is a little bit of a different explanation from one Maccabees. But that aside... Now Judah Maccabees and his followers, uh, the Lord leading them on, uh, recovered the temple in the city. They tore down the altars that had been built in the public square by the foreigners and also destroyed the sacred precincts. Um, they purified the sanctuary and made another altar of sacrifice. This is in chapter 10, by the way. They offered uh, sacrifices after a lapse of two, day, two years. There had been two years when it hadn't been, there had been no sacrifices because of the oppression. And they offered incense and lighted lamps and set out the bread of the presence. Now, uh, the story of the lighting, the, the continual lighting of the oil uh, that is often associated with Hanukkah. Hanukkah, by the way, is the feast of the rededication of the temple uh, or the feast of lights. Uh, it's called that because uh, in rabbinic literature, like I believe the Talmud, uh, one part of the Talmud, it talks about how uh, in this time, it doesn't focus on this story in the Maccabean Revolt, but, uh, and I haven't actually read this literature, but I just know this by listening to stuff and, and, and such, it talks about how uh, the, the only oil that they could find that would actually, uh, that was actually pure for the temple, uh, they could only find enough for one day, uh, and that oil stayed lit for eight days. And that's not mentioned in one or two or three or four Maccabees. So, anyways, one or two Maccabees are the ones that actually deal with this event as is telling it in narrative form. It does mention that they light it, uh, but uh, the the festival is actually celebrating, though it's for eight days. The comparison that's made here in this 
is that it's like the festival of booths. And so they restore the temple. Um, and so on the same day that the day that it had been profaned, uh, it, ha it was purified um, two years later on the 25th day of the same month, which is Chislev. And they celebrated it for, in verse 6 it says, they celebrated for eight days with rejoicing in the manner of the festival of booths. And that's where I get that this is not replacing the festival of booths, but they see it as a new version. <coughs> uh, just as the uh, festival of booths is a celebration of their time in uh, the wilderness before they enter into Canaan, so uh, the festival of the rededication of the temple is uh, so as to say uh, how uh, they were wandering. It says this, uh, how they were remembering how not long before during the festival of booths, they had been wandering in the mountains and caves like wild beasts. So it's to remember the time of persecution of Antiochus. Antiochus' uh, uh, oppression of the Jews is uh, oh, the same time that they're spending in the wilderness away from Jerusalem, the holy place. And so in that way, it's compared to the time that Israel was spending away from Canaan in the wilderness, anticipating entering into the land, going up to the holy place, as is found in uh, Exodus chapter 15 that uh, God would take Israel and plant them in, a, in his place. Uh, so anyways, they celebrate that. And again, that's one of the, the major uh, purposes uh, in this letter, uh, in, in this whole uh, book. So anyways, uh, in chapter 11, Judah and Maccabee continues to defend Jerusalem from the Gentiles that come to take it back. When the Gentiles find that they can't win, the new king Antiochus agrees to let them live by the Torah and even the other nations and Romans support them. And uh, this does not uh, dedicate an entire, um, this does not dedicate an entire chapter to the greatness of the Romans like the earlier one does, like uh, one Maccabees does which gives us some evidence that whereas 1 Maccabees only goes up to the son of Simon in his reign, and it doesn't really talk about what happens there, it was probably written sometime during that, and the author for 1 Maccabees may have even seen the ending, lived during the end events of 1 Maccabees, but the author of 2 Maccabees uh, does not highlight the Romans. He really doesn't. And the Romans are going to come in and take uh, Jerusalem for themselves in 60... Uh, BC. So that's, uh, I, I think that that's the reason why some people see this as some pretty good evidence for a later date. So anyways, it continues on. They, there are still some nations that are not working with them, uh, that are not happy with them. Uh, and Judah continues to fight against them. Uh, in uh, chapter 12, verse 15, it, it compares him to the days of Joshua. Uh, overthrowing the Jericho. Uh, Jericho again. It's uh, showing um, Judah Maccabee as a sort of new uh, Old Testament hero, so as to say. Uh, in one of their wars, uh, they go and they take up the bodies of the fallen. This is in um, chapter twelve, verse thirty-nine, and they bring them back to lie with their kindred in the sepulchres of their ancestors. And then under their tunics of each one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. They have idols. And it became clear to all that this was the reason that these men had fallen. Um, so they blessed the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge, who reveals the things that are hidden. And they turned to supplication, praying that the sin that had been committed might be wholly blotted out. The noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened as a result of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing so, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. And therefore he made atonement for the dead so that they might be delivered from their sin. So um, I read that. Uh, 
I'm at odds with that theologically, and I don't agree with it, but uh, it's important to note uh, the origins of all doctrines. And there you obviously see the first time that it's mentioned uh, that praying for the dead is mentioned. And uh, so it's no wonder why uh, the later early church, it comes uh, to be reading this book in the uh, Greek, along with the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, is going to think that praying for the dead is a very important thing. And I will say, uh, even though I disagree with this for um, reasons that I'm gonna, not going to note because this is not a podcast on that, um, it, the, the reason for praying for the dead is grounded on the fact of the resurrection. According to this author, they uh, argue that if there was no resurrection, then they wouldn't have prayed for the dead. But, because there is, they pray that they will be restored and resurrected, despite their sins. Um, and so, that's uh, an interesting first, and there aren't a whole lot of mentions of that, but there's sh- that that must that should be mentioned. So, anyways, there's a bunch of wars, and I'm just going to highlight some of the most important in um, chapter 14. Uh, there's uh, this man, uh, Alcimus. Maybe it's Alcimus or Alchemist. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'll say Alcimus. It says, who had formerly been high priest, but willfully defiled himself in the times of separation. And uh, if I remember correctly, in 1 Maccabees, it also mentions him, and he bought the high priesthood. Uh, uh, anyways, he goes to, at the time, it's King Demetrius, um, and he gives him a, a golden crown and a palm and uh, some olive branches from the temple. And uh, then, uh, when he finds the opportunity, he tells him about Judah Maccabee and the evil that he's causing. And so he sends for uh, Nicanor to come. And when the Jews hear that Nicanor is coming uh, with Gentiles, they sprinkle dust on their heads. They are terrified. And so uh, when they come to him, uh, Nicanor is he's actually hearing of the valor of Judah and his troops and their courage in battle for their country shrank from deciding the issue by bloodshed that's chapter 14 verse 19 uh, 18 um, and so he actually uh, gives him gifts and they become friends um, and actually he stays in Jerusalem and uh, it says that he kept Judah always in his presence was warmly attached to the man and he urged him to marry and have children and so Judah marries, settled downs, and shares the common life. And this is not told in 1 Maccabees, because it's very much a fan of the, the war Judah Maccabee, and not so much the, the family man, the retired hero. Uh, well, anyways, Alcimus notices this guy's guard is down, and uh, so he's about to talk about the disloyalty of Nicanor. Nicanor finds out, and even though Nicanor likes uh, Judah Maccabee, it says that he's troubled and grieved that he had to annul their agreement uh, when Judah Maccabee had done nothing wrong. Uh, he starts to think of an opportunity in which he can actually destroy him so that he doesn't get destroyed by King Demetrius. Um, but Judah Maccabee notices that he is more austere in his dealings, as it says in verse 30. Um, and so he decides not to meet with him. Uh, and then uh, when uh, the latter became aware that he had been cleverly outwitted by the man, when Nicanor had been aware of this, he is enraged and he declares an oath. He stretches out his right hand toward the sanctuary and swears the oath. If you do not hand Judah Maccabee over to me as a prisoner, I will level the shrine of God to the ground and tear down the altar and build there a splendid temple to Dionysus. He says that to the priests who won't give over Judah Maccabee. And so the priests stretch out their hands to heaven. They call on the constant defender of the nation for him to defend them. Uh, and, and then... Uh, they denounce them. No, sorry, the person who's denounced is Razis. And I love this story as well. This is another awesome martyr story that's just in the middle of this. And it says that earlier, when um, uh, Gentiles and Jews were living together, he had been accused of Judaism because he was 
uh, zealously risked body and life for Judaism. And Nicanor is, wants to show that he's angry at the Jews, so he sends 500 troops to destroy this guy. Uh, so anyways, when the troops were about to capture the tower and were forcing the door of the courtyard, they ordered that fire be brought and the doors burned. Being surrounded, Razis fell upon his own sword, preferring to die nobly rather than to fall into the hands of sinners and suffer outrages unworthy of his noble birth. But in the heat of his struggle, he did not hit exactly, and the crowd was now rushing in through the doors. He courageously ran up uh, he ran up on the wall and bravely threw himself down into the crowd. But as they quickly drew back, a space opened and he fell in the middle of the empty space. Still alive and aflame with anger, he arose, and though his blood gushed forth and his wounds were severe, he ran through the crowd and st uh, standing upon a steep rock, with his blood now completely drained from him, he tore out his entrails, uh, took them in both hands, and hurled them at the crowd, calling upon the Lord of life and spirit to give them back to him again. And this was the manner of his death. Uh, so, uh, clearly, he's praying for a resurrection, uh, which shows that there was a belief in a resurrection for the Gentiles, too, who are faithful to God. Um, I think that's just an awesome story. The dude tries to kill himself with a sword when he sees that these guys are coming for him. That doesn't work. So what does he do? He goes to the top of the tower to fall upon them and maybe takes them out. They move out of the way and he just falls down and just like, oh, okay, but he's still not dead. So he gets up on a rock and he just uh, just is so mad. He just takes out all his organs and his guts and just starts throwing them on these people. I mean, this is insane. And I'm sorry, I forgot to warn you. If you are not into this stuff and you're driving and you just passed out, I, I apologize, um, but I, I just think that this is, this is absolutely awesome. Um, so, anyways, uh, Nicanor hears that Judah and his troops are in Samaria. Um, and so, this guy, um, he comes to have war with Judah Maccabee. And, uh, man, I really want to read all this, but as long as this podcast episode already is, I'll spare you the details. Judah Maccabee, uh, it says that uh, he um, he's encouraging them um, to not fear the attack from the Gentiles and from Nicanor, from encouraging them from the law and the prophets and reminding them of the struggles that they had won. Um, and uh, he armed each of them not so much with confidence in shields and spears as with the inspiration of brave words, and he cheered them all by relating a dream, a sort of vision which was worthy of belief. Uh, and he saw this, Onias, the high priest who had already died, um, he, who was um, speaking uh, fitting, uh, uh, sorry, so the dead Onias appears to him in a dream. And uh, he prays with outstretched hands for the whole body of the Jews. And then, in the same fashion, another appeared, distinguished by his gray hair and dignity, and of marvelous majesty and authority. And Onias spoke, saying, This is a man who loves the family of Israel and prays much for the people in the holy city. Guess who? Jeremiah, the prophet of God. And Jeremiah stretches out his right hand and gave to Judah a golden sword. And as he gave it, he addressed him thus, Take this holy sword, a gift from God, which you will take to strike down your adversaries. And um, I connect this, I note this in, my, in the biblical notes, to uh, Matthew 16, 14, um, where uh, Jesus is asking the disciples, who people say they are, and he said uh, maybe one of the prophets, um, and they talk about uh, not just, uh, a, um, I think th this is actually talking about uh, John the Baptist, who they thought he was, and so one of them says Jeremiah, and I, I couldn't quite figure that out, maybe there's rabbinic stuff on that, because I've read all the other Second Temple Jewish stuff, but uh, here, Jeremiah takes on a special importance that I haven't seen in another text, um, where he appears in a vision, and uh, anyways, I don't know qu quite what to make of that, but that's the closest uh, thing that I could find. Um, that's an interesting rabbit hole if you want to find. But anyways, uh, the men are encouraged by this. And uh, so they go out to fight for him. 
and it goes on. There's even more epic encouragements. Uh, but it says, I love this in verse 27 of uh, chapter 15. So fighting with their hands and praying to God in their hearts, they laid low at least 35,000 and were greatly gladdened by God's manifestation. Uh, and they defeat Nicanor and he lies dead. Um, and, uh, and then it says that they ordered them to cut off his head and arm and carry them to Jerusalem. And uh, they stationed the priests before the altar uh, and they sent for those in the citadel and they showed him his head and his arm, uh, which he had been boastfully stretched out against the holy house of the almighty. And he cut out the tongue of the ungodly Nicanor and said that he would feed it piecemeal to the birds and would hang up these rewards of his folly uh, opposite the sanctuary. And they looked to heaven and blessed the Lord. And they hung his head from the citadel, a clear and conspicuous sign to everyone of the help of the Lord. Uh, now, a couple things. Uh, remember that uh, the story of Judith has Judith destroy Holofernes and cut off his head and tie it to the temple in the same way that he cuts off Nicanor's head, who said that he was going to tear down the temple and build his own temple in the same way that Holofernes was going to destroy the temple. And uh, Judith, which is the female name, version of the name Judah, ties Holofernes' head to uh, the temple the same way Judah ties his head to uh, the citadel, and there's blessing and rejoicing. Judith is celebrated with a feast every year, and then guess what happens? At the end, there's a second, second feast um, that started in 2 Maccabees that's also connected to a biblical feast. So that's uh, an argument for the uh, allegorical reading of Judith, which if you haven't heard, that's episode three of the Apocrypha uh, podcast. Go ahead and give that a listen for sure. Um, and then also, uh, it says that they all decreed by public vote never to let this day go unobserved, but to celebrate the 13th day of the 12th month, which is called Adar in the Aramaic language, the day before Mordecai's day. And I think this is a very special point. Well, number one, this is obviously pointing, referencing to Esther, which I don't know of any extra biblical texts that um, three Maccabees makes some references to Esther. Uh, there are some like similarities to Esther and Judith, um, but this it just outright says Mordecai's name, which you know isn't Esther's name. Uh, but I think that's important because a lot of people dispute the canonicity of Esther. Uh, Esther is not an apocalyptic text in the least. It's very anti-apocalyptic. Um, and some people question the feast. Uh, the, the people in the Qumran community didn't even have that feast in their calendar. And they also don't have the Esther scroll, which is evidence that they might have not believed it was canonical, but we don't know for sure because there's a lot of lost scrolls. But anyways... Um, this makes a reference to Esther. So they clearly see Esther as canonical and they say to observe the feast of the destruction of Nicanor, which is another Gentile ruler who's trying to destroy the Jews, which is obviously comparing him to Haman uh, in, es in the, the story of Esther, a Gentile who tries to destroy the Jews, who's also an Amalekite, which connects this to the, the war between uh, Amalek that f first starts in uh, Exodus, I, I believe, 17, when they first f fight the Amalekites, and uh, Moses prophesies that there will be war between the Jews and the Amalekites through generation and generation. Um, but anyways, uh, that so there are two major feasts there, and they're both connected to biblical feasts. And uh, it assumes that the people already know and are celebrating Mordecai's Day, and this feast is given its uh, recognition based on the recognition of that day. So that says something to the canonicity and the importance, not just for the author, but for the receiver of this text. Um, and to end out, I'll, I'll just read the last um, just uh, three verses of this text. This is how matters turned out with Nicanor. And from this time, the city has been in the possession of the Hebrews. So I will here end my story. If it is well told and to the point, uh, that is what I myself desired. If it is poorly done and mediocre, that was the best I could do. And I mean, if any of the Maccabean uh, accounts were mediocre, it wasn't this one. 
for just as it is, uh, so, and then he goes on and says that he hopes that uh, the readers enjoyed it. And um, in the same way, though this podcast episode is anything but brief, I hope that you have enjoyed it. And if so, you should give it a great review. You should share it. And um, you should read Two Maccabees, uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, Second Temple Jewish texts. You need to read it. As important in historicals, one Maccabees is, two Maccabees is even more so. Uh, also epic is three Maccabees, which is not so much historical. Um, but that is not what we will be talking about next week, um, because that is not the order of the Oxford Annotated Apocrypha. We will be talking about uh, a text that's actually very much just copy and paste of the biblical canon. I won't explain any more, but um, it's very much copy and pasting of books that are already found in the biblical canon with one edition of a story, and that's one Esdras. And later we will come to three and four Maccabees. But until then, I will see you in Babylonia.